Welcome to the Lyric Voice, Writers on Writing, part of the 2021 Central PA Theater and Dance Fest. I'm your host, Jim Colbert, and tonight we're talking to singer-songwriter Carol Ann Solabello. Carol Ann is no stranger to Central Pennsylvania, having performed in the general area as a solo artist, and also as part of No Fuss and Feathers, and as part of the original Red Molly Trio. Carol Ann has released five solo albums, most recently, 2018's critically acclaimed Shiver. Welcome, Carol Ann. Hello, Jim. So nice ah. to see you. <laughs> <laughs> it is indeed. So um, we we don't have a, a lot of a, a lot of time tonight. I wish we had a couple hours to do this because yeah. we've certainly talked about songwriting for a couple hours at a time when we have the opportunity. Um, but I am just gonna say thank you so much for being a part of this and a part of the festival. And I'm gonna dive right into uh, some of these questions. Mm -hmm. So um, I do have, uh, by the way, some of your catalog here, um, including uh, most recent and even even some. Uh, even some vintage. Uh, Ooh, deep cuts. Too. Deep <laughs> cuts. <laughs> <laughs> so essentials and deep cuts indeed. Yeah. Great, great stuff. Uh, so you've lived in a variety of places. Um, you were born and live in the city. And of course, to me, when I say the city, that means New York. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it can be a tremendously inspiring atmosphere for creatives of all type, uh, but especially writers. And I think of some of my favorite older Adrian Rich works uh, when, you know, very much set in, in the city, you know, Patti Smith, Spalding mm -hmm. Gray, uh, Dylan's, you know, Dylan Thomas or Bob Dylan, <laughs> uh, the list, it would be voluminous. Um, mm -hmm. You have some songs that are very much placed in the metro area, just mm -hmm. off, the, off, the, off the bat, Brooklyn in the Rain or uh, Bastille Day. Mm -hmm. um, how much effect is your environment and the people you encounter in the metro area? have upon your writing? Oh, so very much, so very much. Um, it did, like, bef long before I met you in the earlier part of my career, I called myself the urban folky. But I realized, you know, before I got with, with Red Molly and with um, with No Fuss and Feathers, um, yeah, I think even in my earlier stuff, it might have even been even more um, a part of, of what I do and who I am. But I, it's, I, I love this question because, um, it's something that I've had to come and come to um, a reconciliation with in a way, because after being associated, for instance, with Red Molly, a lot of our songs, a lot of the way we presented ourselves was was as though, you know, it was the, that when rural American music was becoming was coming to the forefront of folk, you know, like in the days of we, we, we ascended in the days of uh, Gillian Welch and and David Rawlings, and we were very much inspired by. Uh, oh Brother, Where Art Thou, Song Catcher, these movies that were out about Appalachian songwriting. And so the one song that I contributed to Red Molly in my, as a writer was was called Summertime, and it was a, a rural theme. It was about a time when I was living in Kansas. Um, so it took me a while when I, you know, especially after leaving the group to kind of reconcile the fact that I enjoyed musically the style of Appalachian and old time folk music. And yet here I am living in Brooklyn on the fifth floor of an apartment building and my, I take the subway. I don't, you know, I don't, I, 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 I'm very much a creature of the city that I was born in and I'm very much a creature of the, of the, of the steel and salt. So, uh, <laughs> so I kind of dedicated a whole album, steel and salt to, to, to that thing. I'm going to write, I'm, you know, I, I, on, on steel and salt, for instance, there's a song called Chinatown. It's not about Chinatown in New York city, but it's about the, uh, the cab drivers and the uh, the sanitation workers and the construction workers and the people who make up like salt of the earth people who live in cities like New York and never leave. You know, it's like they're wise. They never leave because they let the world come to them in the city. And this is the kind of people that I came from, working class people of the city. So I like to think it infuses all of my songs, whether or not it's over. Wonderful, mm. wonderful. Uh, so according to my Facebook timelines, 10 years ago today, I was congratulating you for your song matches uh, oh. about gun violence, winning the Susquehanna Music and Arts Festival songwriting competition, oh. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. which I thought was a nice, that's 10 years ago as we're recording this uh, here in early May. Mm -hmm. um, so the song, unfortunately, is 
still very timely. Um, and your, your personal social media posts um, often have, and I think you have a songwriter, a, a songwriter page, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. right, on Facebook. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but your, your personal posts often have you know, a beautiful, inspiring sense of social awareness. Uh, but I wouldn't call you a topical songwriter as a rule. So how challenging is it to kind of channel your inner Phil Oaks uh, or, or Fred <laughs> Gillen Jr. And, right. and come up with a song about controversial or topical matters without, without being too preachy or cliche, which to me is I'm all, anytime I try to do that, I'm over that line. It's like, mm, it's yeah, like, <laughs> I share that, Jim. I share that. I have a really hard time with it, to be perfectly honest. Um, matches went through a lot of, uh, and thank you for remembering that. Uh, Matches is uh, one of my favorite songs, but it took a really long time to get to because at first it was super preachy and it was super angry. It was even angry. I mean, it kind of is angry already, but it was really, really angry in the beginning. <laughs> um, I, there are, the answer, I suppose, is there are a lot of songs that I write and that, uh, to that effect um, that never get heard. Um, mm. I bring them to the songwriting group. To get to get it out of my system, you know, I, I go to Monday nights, uh, not as much but, recently, but to the Jack Hardy songwriters group where we all get together and share our new work with each other. And a lot of political songs end up on the cutting room floor after they go through the process of going there. And everybody's like, oh, great, Caroline, it's good that you got that out of your system. But <laughs> nobody but us is going to like that. So I, <laughs> I, I, I limit it, but it's hard. And I really admire people who are good at it. I mean, there's a small subset of people who are good at it. And I just... I wish I it's something that I aspire to. For sure. I, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and, and that that's true. The people, I mean, there are some people that that is just a gift for them, and they're yeah. just you know they yeah. just nail yeah. it. Yeah, they're out of the out of the you know right out of the box every maybe not every time. I'm sure there's lots of ones that we don't again that we don't hear. Uh, yeah, but, yeah. But, uh, I, yeah. If you figure it out, let me know. <laughs> I, I want to. I so want. To. Maybe that's why I express myself so much, you know, uh, in prose on social media, you know, or sharing other things because I I want it to be known that these are the things I believe in and I and strongly in, but it's hard. it's very difficult to express. It is. It is indeed. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we're creating this interview for the Central PA Theater and Dance mm -hmm. Festival. Uh, your your background was theater before music, mm -hmm. and I've always felt there's kind of a degree of sophistication to your songwriting, mm -hmm. um, sometimes in your choice of wording or vocabulary, and even the enunciation. You know, if I if I'm listening to your songs, I know what the lyrics are. There's there's no question there, um, and it's always spoken to me. Um, so we're all products of our of our influences, but uh, do you think that any of any of your current your work, you know, this part harkens back to your theater roots? Yes, yes, in a word, absolutely yes. And thank <laughs> you for noticing my diction. <laughs> I'm the first person to say that. But I figure, you know, I, I remember when I was starting out in songwriting, there were a lot of folks. You know, it was it was the shoegaze era, and lots of people would stand up at the open mic and look at their shoes and mumble. And I was like, well, if you wrote the lyrics, why don't you want anyone to hear them? I mean, I sweat over my lyrics. I I guess what I most took away from my theater. The way, I mean, I, I took away, you know, a lot of things about performance, but about writing. My hero in theater writing is Stephen Sondheim, the king of the perfect rhyme, the king <laughs> of the perfect <laughs> scan. And the thing is, you don't even notice it when it happens. You know, it's like that. It, it, I, I, I strive for that. And I sometimes, you know, stumble over it. And if, if you hear the rhyme or you detect the cleverness, maybe it's too clever. So, you know, I really, that's my ideal. That's what I'm going for is, is that kind of scan and perfection if there's a if there's a word that does not rhyme if i'm going to use a slant rhyme it's because i really 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 couldn't find anything else and it's really 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 what i wanted to say because i'm, I'm kind of yeah at the songwriting groups people hate me because i'm the rhyme police <laughs> <laughs> excellent I, I, when, <laughs> we were uh, so when we we recorded with uh, Judd Caswell a few few nights ago, I, I was reminding him that one of the things he said to me in a in a long car car ride we happened to have together, it was a sentence just almost uh, Hemingway like to me in its brevity and and impact was lyrics are hard. <laughs> Like three words, boy, you nailed it. <laughs> He's Judd is particularly good at that. 
particularly good at that. Oh, yes. And good at the double entendre. The first song, this is an aside, but relevant because hopefully the folks watching this will have watched Judd's as well. Um, the first song I ever heard Judd Caswell perform was around a campfire at Falcon Ridge Folk Festival, and it was a song called The Men Behind the Bushes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's a political <laughs> song. It is a political song. But if you were listening casually, you might not know that. You know, it was brilliant and i was like i gotta follow this guy around he's he's got he's onto something this guy yeah indeed that is from his blackberry time uh mm -hmm. cd right so um so besides judd uh who are some <laughs> of your favorite writers uh, in any form novels poetry oh. song uh just uh, off the top of your head well off the top of my head right now i could, i just read a memoir by isabel allende a novelist from Chile. She's an American citizen now, but um, she, uh, I, uh, in my younger years, I had read a lot of her uh, her novels um, 20 years ago or so. She is, uh, if uh, for those not familiar with her, she writes in the vein of Gabriel Garcia Marquez in that uh, magical realism kind of style. It's, you know, that was, he's kind of her, you know, spiritual godfather, if you will. So I, I, I love so much about that, uh, and you know, in the in the memoir I just read, she mostly she doesn't really talk about that. She mostly talks about feminism and 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 the way it you know it has engulfed her life and all that. And um, I love Isabel Allende. I love love Garcia Marquez. I just reread uh, One Hundred Years of Solitude because of the way that the things that are. If you haven't, if 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 there's anyone listening to this who hasn't read uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, it's it, it's uh, and that style, it's. Ordinary things are explained with magic or are magical things explained by ordinary. It's just, it's it's this perfect meshing of like flying carpets and, and you accept it as real because it's just, you know, it's just um, um, uh, the, the, the world of the novel. And uh, Isabel Allende is probably the, the, the only, to me, true heir of that, that style of writing in, in my generation. Um, who else do I love? I love Suzanne Vega mm. for... Yes. Above all other songwriters, honestly, <laughs> um, for just what you said before about brevity, about economy, about saying the most with the least, you know, um, I still I still listen to her first album all the time and I still listen to her most recent album all the time. <laughs> so it's like there's the yes, she's gone through changes, but the, the essence of Suzanne Vega is there that she's going to say the most with the least words and the and the sparest of melodies. Um, Stevie Smith. A British poet also does that same thing. You probably know Stevie <laughs> Smith. Uh, uh, Stevie Smith. Here's the shortest poem in the world that Stevie Smith wrote. The English. It's called the English Woman. The English Woman is so refined. She has no bosom and no behind. And that's the end of the poem. That's it. <laughs> and 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 Joni. I would be remiss if I did not mention Joni Mitchell, <clears throat> the queen of all. You know, uh, really. But, you know, Suzanne Vega always seemed that I have two pictures on my on my my board that you can't see here. One is uh, a photograph of Joni and another is a self portrait of Suzanne Vega that she sketched herself. Um, so they look at me all the time that, <laughs> when I'm writing. Very nice. Yeah, that that first I think that for the first Suzanne Vega album was just I think that was a, a really without meaning to over exaggerate. Uh, I think that was really just a life changer for many of us. It was just, I mean, mm, just, yeah. just beautiful. Work. I was in college when that came out, and it, or when I discovered it. I, I, I think it might have come out like the year before I went to college, but around that time, and it just it exploded my head in so many good ways. <laughs> All right. Um, so moving, moving right along. Um, this is probably a bad example, um, but a song like Hiram, and I, mm -hmm. the reason I say it's probably a bad example is Hank, it's about Hank Williams, right? But mm -hmm. uh, so we know how the story ends. Right. But uh, you have some songs with you know very interesting characters and storylines, in, uh, actually including some of your own family, right? Sure. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you do you tend to create a story arc around the characters, or start with a story and uh, you want to tell in song and kind of craft the characters within it? I think it's the former um, coming, maybe this harkens back to the theater background too, mm -hmm. because it's kind of like, okay, I have this character, let's let them talk. What are they going to do? What are they going to do? I, well, I mean, uh, Hiram um, was kind of literally a dream. It's really, I did dream of meeting Hank Williams <clears throat> in this bar 
in this bar that I knew from like the neighborhood when I was a kid <laughs> in a place where I, I mean, I'd never been inside, but you could see inside one of those old man bars, you know, where, the, where it's dark inside, you pass mm -hmm. by during the day and there are people in there during the day and it's really dark and it was mysterious and dusty. Um, but yeah, I, so I had this character. It's like, here, here he is. What happens? What happens? You know, and, and sometimes it's a very small thing that happens. Like I'm, I'm interested in, I'm interested in moments. I'm not necessarily interested in like this giant story arc or something huge happening. I'm interested in like a small moment of connection. Like in Hiram, it's like, well, he took my hand and suddenly, you know, when, when a ghost takes your hand, whoosh, you get this, you know, shot of electricity <laughs> through your body, I suppose. Um, I don't know. I've never really met a ghost, only in a dream, but, or, or in, in some of the other songs that emerge, um, there's, I don't know how the story is going to end. I usually don't know. And it's usually there's not a whole lot of story happening. Sometimes it's a little, there's another song on Shiver called A True North, uh, where a gentleman gets in his car and just drives to Canada. He leaves the United States and goes to Canada. Why? Because his mother came from Canada. And why? Because he's, he's got Alzheimer's and he doesn't want his wife to watch him deteriorate. So he goes to Canada. Yeah, there it's on that record. <laughs> I didn't know how that story was going to end when I started writing it. I just had this character, I had this guy that wanted to get in his car and drive north. And I just, I, there were more verses, you know, that got cut on the, but I, I don't know where they're going. I, yeah, maybe I'm a novelist with a really short attention span. <laughs> just let the character talk, see what happens, you know? Oh, I love it. I, I'm actually going to be asking that same question of, uh, of Rod Picot, and I'm mm. really, really interested in hearing where he goes with that, given Me some too. of the uh, dark material that he does and the, uh, the characters. Uh, and speaking of speaking of the latest album, Shiver, um, <laughs> in describing the songs on it, you said, and I, I love this, these songs are definitely a window into the room where I keep everything I'm afraid of. I, Who wrote mm, that? Mm. <laughs> uh, so, so some writers, and, and actually this harkens back to something you said a little earlier when we were talking, uh, some writers tend to look inward and their writing comes off as kind of more therapy, right, or navel gazing, mm. um, uh, you know, which can be fine. I mean, sure. it's, writing is great, great for therapy, uh, but it isn't always accessible to others. Mm. And something I feel like you do well <clears throat> is you manage to create writing uh, in uh, particularly on Shiver that's both very personal and very accessible. Mm. Um, so it, is it ever in your mind uh, at, while you're writing to consciously balance those two or bridge that gap? Um, and, and, and also this is kind of a, I, I see this a lot, you know, in all the open mics that I've hosted, uh, you know, often young writers have a lot of problem with that. They get very confessional and very personal and you're just sort of like, Ooh, this is making me cringe a little yeah, bit yeah. here. Yeah. Guilty, guilty. I, I will say, <laughs> you know, Shiver is, is the product of, you know, it took me 20 years to get to Shiver. You know, it's a, my, my first record came out in like, what, 1999, 2000. So it took me a lot of trial and error to get to that point and to realize that me talking about my own heartbreak in my own voice is not necessarily, you know, what's going to connect with people. But what might connect with people, I'm terrified of like, you know, getting Alzheimer's and losing my mind because it's a, it, there's a history of it in my family. I'm terrified of that. So what do I do? I let it out in a character and let this character speak in True North. Uh, and and uh, there's another song on there called Meeting the Muse um, that had a bridge that was a little more um, personal and like, you know, navel gazing, I guess, and like uh, me a little more naked in myself. But we cut the bridge and kind of incorporated some of those ideas into the voice of the muse for for that. The muse is basically, you know, my own voice inside my own head speaking about all my insecurities um, and turned the turned what was the bridge into a vocalese instead. Um, so yeah, I'm really conscious of it because um, yeah, I don't, I don't want to be that songwriter. I don't want to be the, <laughs> and I also am very private. I mean, I think that's part of it. It's like, I want to be, uh, it's, it's like the eternal songwriter problem. I'm sure you can relate to this where it's like, <laughs> look at me, look at me. Don't look at me. Look at me. Don't look at me. You know? <laughs> like, listen to what I have to say. Oh no, don't listen. You know, uh, it's, 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 yeah, we have, I have this constant battle. I'm a terribly introverted person, but I have the need to be heard somehow. Yeah. I think you did a, a wonderful job with that on Shiver. It's very, yeah, very, very nice job. So uh, we are, we are running a little, running kind of out of time here. Uh, I want to wrap up with one more question. 
Uh, we are talking to Carol Ann Solabella from beautiful Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> um, so we've, we've survived uh, through the pandemic so far. Mm. Um, uh, and, you know, it's been a, certainly a challenging time for, I think, most performing artists and writers and just, you know, a, a nasty time for creativity in general. Yeah. It's, you know, uh, just dealing with surviving. But uh, how have your writing habits changed or evolved during the pandemic? Um, so it, has the time of limited gig opportunities been fruitful for, for productivity? Uh, or, or has it been the opposite? Because I, I feel like people are either at one extreme or the other in general from, from when I talk to them. Yeah, I, and the honest answer is both. Uh, 2020 was a, a, a desert for me. <laughs> once, once the shutdown happened, I was, I was sad, I was angry, I was paralyzed, I was terrified, I was anxious, and I really I wrote very few songs last year. I mean, there was maybe one keeper that I wrote all year. And then... Uh, I forced myself out of that by joining up with my friend Carrie Cooper's project, Real Women, Real Songs, mm -hmm. which I did eight years ago as well in the first edition. And this is season three now. And what <laughs> happens in this, and Jim, you're familiar with it, but for those listening, um, uh, we write, a group of women have signed on to write one song a week and post a video of it every single week for a year. Uh, so uh, based on prompts, every we get a weekly prompt, we write a song, we make a video, and off it goes into the interwebs for everyone to see. So I have forced myself into creativity. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I guess that's coming off uh, of the words of, of the great, late, great Jack Hardy, whose songwriting group I still belong to. He said, don't wait for inspiration. Just sit down and write a song. How do you become a songwriter? Write a song. You know, if you had to. And again, I have a song due tomorrow. Have I written it yet? No. <laughs> no. Ah, uh, the night is still young, right? That's right. You're, I'll you're do in it the tomorrow. city. The yeah. night is young. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, my hat is definitely off to anyone who participates in that project. Carrie Cooper is a great, oh. great songwriter, a great person, and just, I mean, full of life. Yes. Uh, how, how else would you describe her? Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, so I wish you, wish you luck with getting that one wrapped up. It is a wonderful project. And if you're not familiar with it, check it out. It's, uh, it's really cool. And, and imagine putting yourself in that position where you're writing a song every week and then not, not just writing it, but posting a video of it. So you, yeah, you, that's the hard you part. Can't, you can't hide. Right, yeah. <laughs> Warts and all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, we are going to wrap up for this evening. We will be during the festival, June 11th through 13th, we will be having a uh, live performance video, um, well, recorded live performance video from Carol Ann. And uh, we have been talking to Carol Ann Solabello. We'll have her live performance as part of the festival, June 11th through 13th. And you can visit our website for up to the minute information, www.centralpatheater.org. And we're on all the social medias. So check us out. Lots of great things going on this year. And thank you so much, Carol Ann, for being part of this. Oh, my pleasure, Jim. Thank you so much. It's nice to be in the same virtual room with you. <laughs> it, it really, it, this is great. Yeah, we, uh, we've not seen each other in person for, for far too long, um, but uh, that will change at some point. Yes, it will. Yes, it will. <laughs> I have faith. So. Me too. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.